Hello, uh, welcome to the Early Childhood Voices Conference. If this is your first presentation, lovely to have you here. Uh, if you've listened to many before this, I too am really looking forward to jumping in and hearing uh, some of the fantastic voices that are emerging within the presentations at this conference. Uh, today, I'm speaking about the social and emotional impacts of home learning for children during the COVID-19 pandemic and really looking at what the literature is telling us at this point. First of all, I'd really like to pay my respects to the Radjuru people, uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I am on at the moment in Dubbo, New South Wales, Australia. I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, both past and and present and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are listening to this recording today also. So a little bit of a background, um, as you can see on the slide and as you know from your general knowledge that school closures during COVID-19 was really the first time on a large scale that uh, educational institutions around the world were closed and children were needing to learn within their home environments in a, in, in a structured and semi-structured way. Uh, there's a lot of literature that's starting to emerge that considers those social and emotional impacts that this may have had on children. So my interest in this topic uh, comes from my background background in social work. So as a social worker, I worked in statutory child protection, I worked in roles in non-gov ch uh, child welfare, as well as uh, working alongside families and women as well in health contexts. My um, academic interests and my teaching uh, here at CSU are uh, focused on child welfare within the social work discipline and personally I'm a mum to four kids myself so my stepdaughter's 15 and my other children are three six and eight so as you can imagine for us home learning was such an experience and it really uh, for me, it was something that I, I wanted to know more about. For us, it was a really positive experience. You'll see some of the photos of our time home learning throughout this presentation. But I was acutely aware that for those around us, and we live in quite a low socioeconomic area, it wasn't that, you know, we were in quite a privileged position and that wasn't the experience of everyone around us. For lots of children, as we know, school is their safe place. School is where they go to escape the things that are happening at home. School is where they go to be fed, to be where they go to feel loved and cared for and safe. Uh, so for me, my interest in looking at social and emotional wellbeing during the pandemic really, um, as we'll see towards the end of the presentation, stems to how we in both social work and educational context and early education as well can think about supporting the well-being of children. We already, there's so much fantastic work already happening in that space. But what can we learn from this experience of children being removed from those environments to, you know, further what we're already doing in terms of supporting well-being, but also think about what we're doing and whether we can do it differently. Sorry, I'll, I'll keep looking down as I change slides too. I'll try not to. So the aims of this presentation are to share the results of a scoping literature review that I undertook, looking at the literature that has emerged, and there's been heaps of it. So we'll have a look on the next slide, just, just how much there was at that point. And on my data collection occurred in July this year. So there's been even more published since then. I'd like to also, as I've mentioned, consider what this means for children, families and professionals moving forward. I utilised, as mentioned, a scoping literature review methodology. Uh, so just very briefly, uh, that entails looking at databases and really methodically uh, and rigorously searching the literature uh, of what's out there and having a look and drawing together themes and that, that sort of thing. So I looked at six databases. This was in July 2022. I utilised inclusion criteria. So I was really looking for articles that considered the social and emotional impacts of home learning during mandated COVID-19 school closures. So I wasn't looking at anything where there were situations where children were, you know, homeschooled in an ongoing way um, or where you know, they'd had attended some sort of other schooling in that during that time, but really that learning that was happening within the home. 
my sample included uh, studies that looked at children aged 4 to 13. This was, of course, a little tricky. And in some instances, I do have children that were a little younger than that. Uh, there were some papers looking at children within this age range, but then also children a little older, and they were still included. However, if it was a study just looking at, for example, infants or just looking at adolescents, they were excluded. I only wanted to look at studies that were really child focused. So there has been a lot of literature that's emerged looking at teachers experiences, parent experiences, you know, experiences of the wider community. I really wanted literature that was coming from that child focused perspective to know what these experiences were like for our children. Inherently, a lot of this was parental report on children, as you can imagine for the age range as well. Uh, there was also one study included in the final literature, which included teacher perspectives. So the mix of literature was sort of a bit of children's voices, a bit of parents and children's, potentially parents only thinking about how their children felt, but there were a lot of different voices coming through. But my main aim was to include that child voice. Um, and of course, the literature needed to be published between 2019 and 2021, which wasn't a big problem because inherently the uh, content of the paper was looking at that. You can see a Prisma diagram here too. The initial database searches pulled up thousands of articles that really on this topic. When I uh, utilised the inclusion and exclusion criteria, I came up with 530 papers, which I then scanned, and my final batch of literature was 24 studies that uh, really matched that inclusion criteria to a T. I wanted to talk a little bit about what I found. Um, so no more of the boring stuff. I'm not going to talk about all of the rigor and scanning titles and scanning abstracts and reading whole articles. It was very time consuming, but let's just get to the meaty good stuff. So there was four key impacts that I found throughout this research. The first impact was that there was a general decline in well-being for children during this period. Uh, as you can see on the slide, the common domains of well-being that were reported on within the literature included boredom, anger, sadness, worry and loneliness. There were many more, but I found these to be the really common themes. Um, interestingly, three studies identified positive impacts of lockdown mandated home learning for students. And, you know, if you think back to I had 24 that I was looking at in the end, it was only three that identified um, positive impacts. So Flynn, for example, talks about the way in which home learning provided opportunities for individual support to children from parents, learning about your children's strengths and needs and children developing new skills. Um, anecdotally, from my own experience, I found that it was great for my children to spend that time together and to grow those bonds and to, to learn in a, a non-structured environment. It was probably, <laughs> to be honest, my home was probably a little more structured than a lot um, with my background. But yeah, I, I sort of saw these positive elements, but the literature and, and the families that were interviewed and other experiences that I've heard anecdotally have not been um, the same. We found literature um, cited as well an increase in negative mental health outcomes. So children's mental health was one of the primary concerns of parents and teachers during home learning. I know that for our local uh, primary, public primary school, teachers weren't too worried about academic outcomes for our children in our community. They were worried about welfare. Um, so, you know, literature is really telling us that that's something that was and needs to be a key concern, not only at this time, but ongoing as well. We know that men negative mental health outcomes for children has increased over years preceding the pandemic. Uh, we now need to know a lot more about what's going to happen longitudinally and what the impact has been. But what this literature is telling us is that during this period, there was an increase in negative mental health outcomes reported. Uh, there's also a correlation between increases in negative mental health outcome for children and other family factors. So, you know, if there were caregiver psychopathology, family relationships impacted as well as existing child health issues and other vulnerabilities. Um, using a lot of the studies use standardized measures, so things like the strengths and difficulties questionnaire or other standardized measures, but there was also a lot of qualitative self and parental reports. So for a lot of the studies, when it came to talking about mental health, it was a lot of parents saying what they thought about their children. Um, and interestingly, when 
children self-reported, they actually reported lower levels than what their parents reported at this time. Sorry, I, yeah, I'm very conscious that I keep looking down when I change my slides. I need to be able to do that seamlessly. <laughs> the third implication or impact of home learning was on lifestyle factors. So there's a couple of things in this category. Primarily, um, an increase in screen time, a decrease in physical activity, uh, and sleep uh, disruptions or disturbances or inconsistencies. Um, so when children were questioned, I love this quote, um, on how they spent their time during lockdown, the most common responses were sleeping, eating, and spending much more time playing computer games. Uh, and, you know, I think... That really speaks volumes. Inherently, our children were going to be spending more time on devices, uh, not only to engage with the learning materials, which for, for many families were online, um, but also to keep up connections. I know for myself, it was the first time that my young children had had any type of um, online connection with their peers because they're of an age where those connections are generally face to face. But with schools being closed for so long, we had to think creatively and also, you know, with restrictions around meeting face to face and things, we had to think creatively about how that looks. So in my home, I know that my children did spend much more time online than what they would have previously, which would have been quite minimal at their age. Um, children's self-reports of screen time were higher than what their parents reported within the studies, which I think is an interesting fact, uh, point as, you know, as a practitioner and as a parent, I know that as a parent, if a researcher asked me, I'd probably maybe try to play that down a little bit too. We have a lot of knowledge now about potential negative impacts of screen time, but also that societal pressure that it's not really something that's ideal in terms of parenting to be used, utilizing a lot of screen time. So I can see where that um, discrepancy in the reporting amount would have come from. Uh, Sal et al. 2020 found that the increase in time spent on electronic devices yielded a higher total difficulty score on a strengths and difficulties questionnaire. So what I found with these lifestyle factors is that uh, there was a correlation between, you know, that increase in screen time, that decrease in physical activity and the sleep disturbances that uh, impacted upon the social and emotional well-being. Uh, and that, I mean, that doesn't come as a surprise to us within the field, but it is something we need to be really aware of um, moving forward and also working with children post home learning period, which, you know, many of us are doing now, uh, whether that be in a personal or a professional capacity. The important positive role play by technology was also highlighted in some of the literature, not a lot of it, but some of it, um, you know, in terms of that connection with others and uh, which, of course, is essential for social and emotional well-being. Um, you know, children that were more physically active were seen to have found to have fewer psychosocial problems. Um, and in terms of the sleep disturbances, it was things around poor quality sleep or less sleep, which again was correlated with that increased use of televisions and, and computer, you know, iPads and phones and things like that. Uh, and also the, the decreased physical activity, of course, you know, if kids aren't running around and getting tired, they're not going to sleep that well. Uh, not only does school play a really important role in, in physical activity for children within the, you know, the school day and the curriculum, but it's those after school activities and those team sports and those opportunities just to play in a playground that children really miss during this time. Uh, and, you know, a lot of literature was talking about becoming quite sedentary as well. The last uh, impact that I found, which, you know, as a social worker coming into this, wasn't, uh, you know, hugely surprising to me but is really, really important moving forward in how we think about the ongoing implications and impacts for our children and for our schools is that um, school closures really intensify existing inequalities for disadvantaged children. Um, the literature highlighted disparities in social and emotional well-being for children based on their family's socioeconomic status. Several studies reaffirm that for many families, existing vulnerabilities were exasperated during the pandemic and directly impacted on children's experiences of home learning and subsequently their social and emotional well-being. Um, in addition to existing vulnerabilities, as we know, the pandemic resulted in lots of new vulnerabilities for families, loss of income, um, you know, changing working conditions and things like that. Uh, 
another limitation of some of these studies that I looked at was that the cohorts that were involved in the studies were uh, not the most disadvantaged and vulnerable families. Uh, due to the nature of the pandemic, none of these studies were able to occur face to face. Uh, they're all online, which necessitated firstly access, um, you know, ability to access uh, literacy, ability to answer the questions, not having the researcher there with you to, to work you through that process. For a lot of the studies, it was a convenient sample. So people known to the researcher already, potentially people within their own sort of world or, or social circles as well, which is problematic in itself. Um, but it meant that though, you know, the data we have on disadvantage and vulnerability would be significantly underreported. There would be so, so many families that aren't represented in these studies, uh, which I think is something that we really need to think about as well. So the implications of all of this, um, what we can see is that students were removed from safe and positive psychosocial environments provided by schools. The research highlights the important role played by schools in supporting social and emotional well-being of children. Um, emerging scholarships also draw on attention to existing social um, economic inequalities for children, which were only exasperated during the pandemic. I feel that we need a greater focus on social and emotional well-being of children, and that's required at a policy and practice level. Um, for me, you know, it makes more sense that the provision of welfare services to children is universal. All children went through this experience. Some were better off than others, absolutely. But all, you know, experienced some of these things. All experienced changes in well-being. All experienced changes in, in mental health, whether they be negative or positive. Ensuring that all primary schools, at the very least, have access to welfare staff, counsellors, social workers, psychologists, or other relevant professionals should really be at the top priority for educational departments. Targeted support and programs for those children with existing vulnerability or disadvantage need to be expanded within schools and communities. We know that our teach there's a teacher shortage. We know that our teachers are doing such fantastic work in addressing well-being and, and things with our children, but they don't have the time to, you know, offer that holistic and tailored support that is needed. So for me, you know, uh, I can see clearly that there is a need here. I know that the department in, in our state is doing a review on wellbeing in schools. And I do hope that, you know, we do see many more supports being offered for our children in that environment. I've got a ton of references, so please feel free to email me if you don't catch them all as I'm flicking through. I'm more than happy to have a chat or answer any questions. I think I didn't address it very well, but my substantive position is as a social work lecturer at CSU Uni, so please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or any comments or any thoughts or if you'd like the slides. Uh, but thank you so much for listening today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.